Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to my channel. Today we're doing a reading for Sign of Capricorn. And keep in mind that this does not resonate for every Capricorn. If you'd like a personal reading, it's going to be the first link in the description down below. I'll repeat that. First link in the description down below for a personal reading. Also, find a bunch of things there in the description. You can find my Etsy shop, which has my tarot and my oracle cards on there. A bunch of things there on my Etsy shop in the description down below. You should definitely go check that out. Go and go buy something. Really appreciate that. Currently have a sale going on. Um, you can also find my shirt store on my website, different social media platforms I'm on, as well as Patreon. All that's in the description down below. If you'd like to donate to the channel, feel free to do so. I do appreciate donations here. So, Capricorn, let's start with the prayer first. Let's get this. It's so like number 37 with the goddess Kali over here. This is Kali, beloved wearer of the Mala of skulls and marigolds. I bow to you. You are the way, the healing, the integrity, and the resolution. You are the blessing in both chaos and in grace. I release fear and attachment to outcome. I become free and ready to receive and be held in, within your divine will. I choose to trust you unconditionally. I surrender all concerns to you now and open to receive clear alignment with the highest past path for resolution and release that brings spiritual benefit to all beings. This is Jai Ma Kali. Alright, and then we have number three. The goddess Kuan Yin over here. This is beloved Kuan Yin, Sky Dancer. Blossoming with creation. I am one with the power of the divine feminine. I am one with peace, with creation. That will manifest. I am love. I am surrendering. I am yin. I am blessed. I let go to receive. I let go to flow. Peace in my heart now fertilizes my creation to grow. Okay, Capricorn. So that's a prayer for you. Now let's see what spirit has in store for yourself. Number seven with Horus. Number one with the Mon. Number one with the Ta. This one's actually not a good one, Capricorn. With number three with Seth, who's a trickster. Alright. I'm doing some way. Um for this one. This is one you actually need to remove. Right here. You can do that by asking a goddess Kali to remove it. You can do it by writing it down on a piece of paper. Remove this being. And then burn it. We have number eight with Emotep. Alright, Capricorn. So we have hidden forces here. You are creating something in your life, maybe even something with healing. Okay. Horus. I actually don't remember what Horus represents in this deck. I also feel like another thing that's being brought to you on light, what is hidden, this right here. Okay, but either way, you are also creating here. Like I said, there's something with healing, maybe. Okay, and you have these beings here with you. We have a Ta, we have a Ma, we have Emotep, Horus, all wanting to connect with you. Number one being important for you, number one could be like that at beginnings. And yes, I am going to be reading out of the book. If you don't like that, you can go somewhere else. So you have Patel, the opener. Patel has been called the greatest of all old, all the old gods of Memphis. Primeval in origin, he has been giving such titles as the very great god who came into being in the earliest time, and the father of beginnings, and creator of the eggs of the sun and the moon. His name has been variously interpreted as sculptor, engraver, or opener. At the head of a bald, bearded man, Ptah is wrapped in mummy form with his hands protruding. 
He stands in an open doorway upon the point of mid back, holding the scepter that combines the jet on the wood. He is also often represented sitting at the potter's wheel, where he works fashioning the eggs of heaven and earth. Ptah was the god of all craftsmen who worked in metal and stone. Ptah and his co-worker Kinemu followed Thoth's orders in creating the universe. It was Ptah who made the new bodies of the dead in Amanta. He was at once smelter, caster, and sculptor. He also created the iron slab that was said to form the floor of heaven. In this car, Ptah is surrounded by fire, the primordial and sacred fire, which is living energy. The mummified Ptah represents this fire, incarnated in matter. In other words, he materializes the metaphysical principles of creation, and he is found in every heartbeat and in every sound. He is the living spirit in the house of human flesh. Ptah is shrouded in the weaving of meat, the crossing of energies to create new form. In the Book of the Dead, there is a reference to the deceased transforming in himself into Ptah, where his tongue becomes like that of the god. In Amansa, Ptah is also protective netter, providing weapons for the deceased in their battle against demons. The female counterpart of Ptah is Sekma, the fiery lion goddess who carries the lotus scepter of life. She is often shown standing behind Ptah, placing her hand on the back of his head, transmitting her power to him. For without this female principle, Ptah is incapable of creation. Ptah is also connected with the goddess Met. All he creates, whether terrestrial or celestial, is in accord with her cosmic law. He is directly linked to the eight primordials, the most ancient expression of elemental life. It's like a, a poem. I can read as well. Ask me. It says, The verses from love poems of ancient Egypt captured the magical essence of ancient Memphis. It says, Down the river, down the river to the rhythms of railroads. Going to Memphis, my bundle of rushes on my shoulder. Memphis, known as the life of the two lands, and to the great god, Ptah, I will say, God of truth, let me lie with my love tonight. It says, ah, the very thought turns river to wine. The wine goes to my head. Ta inhabits the river reeds. Out of Sekma, the riverside flowers. The god Nefertum blooms in the lotus bloom. It says, the act of creation. All right, Capricorn. In who comes in peace. Zep is the god of healing and medicine, the great healer who watched over all who practiced the mingled sciences of medicine and magic. Worshipped primarily at Memphis, Emotep was called the son of Ptah and expressed the creative nature of his father through his healing powers. According to legend, Emotep actually lived in Egypt and was advisor and chief architect to the pharaoh, Zoser of the Third Dynasty. He was also a skilled physician, so famous and highly regarded that he became deified some 2,000 years after his death. As a netter of medicine, Imhotep was invoked for healing of disease and injury. His work involved both the living and the dead, for he also attended to the embalming of bodies using spices and drugs and the magical incarnations or incantations that ensured the soul's protection. As a great sage and man of knowledge, Imhotep absorbed some of the attributes of Thoth, reflected in this image where he is shown seated with a papyrus scroll on his lap. I don't know how to say that word, but it's like a, it's like a Greek healing staff that you will see like Hermes with. Alright, this right here. Yeah. In his right hand, he would do it. He uttered the words to protect the dead. He was the wise one, the one who comes on to him who calls upon him wherever he may be. This staff shows his power of directing energy for healing, balance, and harmony. This Imhotep was called upon when the Nile failed to flood and spread its life-giving waters across the delta. It was Imhotep who saved Egypt from starvation after seven years of terrible drought. In his role of architect, Imhotep was known as the master of works, but it is as a healing netter that he was most highly revered. Later to be identified, some god, I don't know how to say, who brought the art of healing to the Greeks. It says the power of healing to healers. So you're doing something important with healing here. You're creating, and you're doing something with healing. Like this could be medicines, like herbs, this could be spiritual. There's something that you're creating. Capricorn is very important. Has a lot of healing power.
of Amon, that which is hidden. The center of Amon's worship was back as a city at Thebes and dates back to ancient Egypt's empire. But the Theban mysteries were focused in the triad of Naturu Amon Matmakanshu. The oldest references to Amon connect him directly with the eight primordials. deals. In one form, he has a frog's head, and his female counterpart has the head of a snake. They take their place in the company of the gods, along with Nu, Kehu, Hethet, Keku, Keku, Hethet. As a netter whose name is hidden, Amon is a mysterious and inscru inscrutable principle, personification of the hidden and unknown creative power, which was associated with the primordial abyss gods in the creation of the world of all that is in it. Capricorn, I wonder if this has been, like, like, let's say you, you already know that you're a healer or whatever, right? I wonder if it's unknown to you how much healing power you have inside of yourself, how much you can tap into, how much creation power you have. You see what I'm saying? It says, Amon is a cosmic principle not born from any god. He is shown with the ancient serpent Kemetep coiled around him. Kemetep imbues Amon with his primordial power, which is then transmitted to his son Kanchi. Amon is hidden, and only his effects in the material world are visible. As the invisible god with such tremendous creative power, he is linked with the invisible god with such tremendous power and cre tremendous creative power. He's I just oh my god, I just repeated myself. He's linked with the dwarf star on its mysterious orbit around Sirius, and the black and white ram's horns also refer to the energies emanating this double star system. The most obvious feature of Amon is this phallic, yeah, whatever, phallic feature. He is always shown the erect phallus in his human form. His power manifests as the dew, or sumi, the lunar fluid which the emanating fire is contained. Is called the Lord of the Thalas, the God of the Lifted Hand, both of which refer directly to the hidden rituals of sex and generation. During the 12th dynasty, when the princess of Thebes took over the rule of Egypt, the cult Amon became powerful, uh, became the most powerful of all the gods, and he is combined with the great sun god to become Amon Ra. All the old sun gods were absorbed by Amon Ra, and all the attributes of Ra were united with this primeval power of Amon. As a unity, Amon Ra was an invisible creative power, which was the source of all life in heaven and on earth and in the great, great deep and in the underworld, and which made itself manifest under the form of Ra. This explains the success of priests of Amon in making their god the greatest in Egypt by bringing our attention to the changing cosmic seasons during that period of Egypt's history. The procession of the equinoxes of Hap the Bull, which signified the age of Taurus, was succeeded by Ares in generating fire of Amon Ra, the entry into the constellation of Ram Brown, 2200 BC, coincided with the springtime in Egypt, which is always ruled astrologically by Ares. So the ram handed god became the perfect vehicle for the cosmic spirit of that time, as the fish later became the symbol for the now ending age of Pisces. During these cosmic ages, the dominant constellation influences all the process of life on Earth, including symbols and ceremonies of religious expression. It is not that the principles themselves change, it is the celestial background that highlights specific functions and symbols that changes. Spiritual teaching needs to be modified so that the cosmic season can be given its fullest expression. It was during the age of Aries that the lunar Amon associated with primordial water united with the sun god Rod to rule in Egypt right up to the Christian era. In this card, the lunar element is evoked by the water on which Amon stands. Two obelisks on either side of him receive and transmit the celestial influences and Thebes, the creative principle of life, was essentially considered to be the trinity. Amon, Ra, Ptah, three in one. Amon is a mysterious hidden power. Ra is the head containing all potential for creation, and Ptah is the body. The divine fire manifested in nature. Amon was for the Roman gods the Jupiter, and it is in context that men are answered. Being the inseminating aspect of Amon can be regarded as Jupiter. It says hidden forces at work the source of creative power. Okay, 
So we have one last one. Just cast it. Says that which is above, that which is above Capricorn, above. Okay, so think about that. Like heaven, I don't know, above can be like the the hawk, which horses here. Maybe even seeing hawks. It says Horus is one of the best known of the Egyptian gods. Throughout the dynasties, he was widely worshipped from the very earliest period of Egypt's history. His original name, Hero, means that which is above, and is the form of a hawk headed man wearing the red and white crowns of the south and north united that this netter is usually depicted. He holds the Ankh of life, a bow and arrows in his right hand, and a club in his left. Above the double crown is the eye of Horus. The hawk was the first living creature to be worshipped throughout the double land, and as the keen sided ruler of the air and the heights of heaven. The hawk became the sacred creature of the king of the gods. Horus became the symbol of divine kingship on earth. The royal power is Horus incarnated on earth, and as a pharaoh comes Horus. He has a right to rule as a son of Aset ruled over Egypt. Many forms of Horus are described in Egyptian mythology. Some of them are most prominent being Horus the Elder, says Herer Ur, Herer Hetet. And here, oh god, that's a long one. It is Horus, the son of Aset, and also. Horus, the elder, was a primordial netter, solar principle, who by day was the face of heaven, and Seth was the face of night. The sun was referred to as the eye of Horus, one of the eyes through which the serious energies are transmitted. The other eye of Horus was the moon, shining with the reflected light of the sun. As the power of the heat of the sun, he was the hero of the head, crowned with the double winged sun disk in Ura, power which fills all heaven and the world with his brilliance and light. So, Capricorn, if you really feel like you're, you're connecting with that of like heaven here, okay, the hidden power, that of heaven to create that creation, okay, that healing, okay, this is very important. But it was Horus, the son of Aset, who appealed most strongly to Egyptian imagination. He was a great warrior who destroyed the enemies of Ra without mercy, and in his internal battle with Seth, he became the cosmic drama of light and darkness who was most vividly portrayed. Horus's archetype is the victor, the winner who obtains what he is fighting for. He was born from Aset after she had provided the dead body of Aser, and he grew up with one great passion, to reclaim his father's heritage from the usurping Seth. And avenge his father's death. When Egypt was divided into two kingdoms, Horus ruled the fertile deltas of the north, while Seth ruled the arid deserts of the south. The final victory of Horus gave him kingship over the two lands, an event which has been interpreted historically as the conquest of the southern lands by a king from the north. Even as a young child, Horus was confronted by Seth's enemy, and the scorpion sent to kill him, almost succeeded but for thoughts and invention. He grew up to be a formidable warrior, trained by his father and armed with an iron spear and chains, which he killed and bound his enemies. In this form, he was called Horus, the avenger of his father. The battle battles against Seth and Apep were filled with slaughter. Horus was praised by Ra for his courage and in defending the light and life-giving powers of the sun, for Horus was Ra himself reborn, the sun god victorious over death. From his birth in the delta, Horus is the divine light held earthbound. I said. This fight is the eternal struggle between light and darkness, the fundamental polarity between the cosmos and chaos. Says Horus obtains the power of his father, not by killing Seth, but rather by keeping Seth under control, by keeping the balance between these two principles. As a solar principle, he is in intimately involved with the creation and rulership of the world, radiating energy and illumination, illuminating the earth. But 
by its very nature the sun casts a shadow the same shadow Horus is twin, against which he must continually struggle. This is in the dua. Horus helped the dead, even as he helped his own father, by mediating between his between the judges of the dua and the soul of the deceased. He raised up the ladder that reached into heaven and held it in place while the deceased climbed up from the darkness into the light of Ra. He watched over the funeral rites and ceremonies of Osir and was assisted by Afetiru. His four sons who hold up the pillars of heaven. The way of Horus is the royal way of his son, the direct path of magical transformation. While his father Osir represents the past, Horus is the eternal present. While Osir dies to be resurrected, Horus partakes of Osir's immortality and is the ever living god. Another form of Horus is the young child Heru. Start. That word, but a newborn baby, emerging from a lotus with one finger held to his lips. In this aspect, Horus is the personification of the rising power of the sun, the power within a seed beginning to sprout. This describes Horus as having fair hair, fair complexion, with blue eyes, like many blonde and blue-eyed solar gods of other traditions. So Sycamore is sacred to him. It says, Victory! The winner triumph over adversity. See, I feel like there's a lot of victory coming with this Capricorn. A lot of victory there, connecting with the heaven there. Creation. Maybe this was hidden to you. Maybe you knew about it, but you didn't know the extent of it, okay? And there's a lot there's a lot of change happening with this. Connecting with those beings is very important. These beings that I showed you here. Not this one I showed you. There's a reason why it's upside down right now. These right here. Which, oh, you can see it. Okay, so that's messages for you. That's a being connecting with you. So let's get some ruins and show us yourself. We have number nine, Capricorn. Maybe number nine has significance to you here. Life path number nine, or just number. There's something about nine. All right, so there's some sort of synchronicity there. And this dragon moon, which could be a symbol of Kuan Yin over here. Kuan Yin is connected to heaven, by the way. We have this Chinese zodiac sign of the monkey. We have Sun God Ra, which we have all three here. Now we have Ita, Amon, and Ra. We were talking about those three. All those three there. We have Anubis. We have this sun bill, which connected, connected with the sun. Obviously, of Horus and Ra is being here. And the rose. Rose is important for the heart chakra. Maybe you're also doing something here with roses. Some sort of healing with roses, I guess. You'll have to tell me about that. Yeah, things appear still, but there's a lot of there's a lot of changes happening in the self. There's commitment to the self. There also could be commitment to what I feel like is your spirituality, your path, and also there could be commitment as in love as well. So that's all I have for you. And like I said, first link in the description down below. For personal reading. Also go to my Etsy shop, go and like go buy something. Really appreciate that. If you want to see more content, don't forget to like subscribe. Bye guys.